Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 386, Dosing Hormone Replacement, Fast and Slow Metabolizers. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. You have been in practice in the St. Louis area for about 15 years, focusing primarily on hormone replacement, testosterone and estrogen pellets. And through all of that experience, you have developed a reputation as having an expertise in proper dosing. In the literature that we read, the uh, conventions that we attend, doctors are, are disputing constantly about what's the proper dose for a 200-pound man, a 300-pound woman, a 40-year-old person, a 70-year-old person. How do you figure this out? What's the right thing to do? And that's where your expertise is focused. So you've learned a lot. And this week, we're going to talk about the things that you've learned about people with fast metabolisms and slow metabolisms. So maybe we should start by talking about that and what you mean when you say that. Okay. So when when we're talking about any drug, Mm -hmm. every, a drug is based, the dosage for any drug is based on a 70 kilogram, um, that's like 170 uh, pound man. Okay. But not, it's not dose for your size. It's so it's not, not dose for women. Dose typical for dose. Women. The typical dose is not dose for women at all. Yeah. So we learned this and accepted it in medical school. But now that I have practiced all these years in OBGYN and now in hormones, I've realized that people who are twice that weight, yeah. you know, somebody, I mean, we have a lot of people who are 300 pounds and they're not just that they're big, big muscular people who need twice the dose of many medications because of their size, just to get enough blood level to like in an antibiotic kill a bacteria or to get enough blood level to fix a heart arrhythmia. So that's not really well accepted in the medical world. but, But it's not just size. It's also age. I mean, you have a lot of 70 and 80 year old patients that come to your practice. Mm -hmm. And as people age, their metabolism slows down. Mm -hmm. And so the standard dosage for when they were youthful Mm -hmm. is, is wrong. And and so there, there are challenges in medicating the elderly. So in medicating anyone, you have to look at their age. Uh You should look at their size. You should look at their activity level. And you should also ask them in general, do you have to go back for a second course of antibiotics? Do oh, you have to get, does one pain pill or one Tylenol work for you? Or do you have to get double the dose that's recommended for you to, to get, relief. get relief? Yeah. So this is really a question of something we can't measure in medicine. It is how you metabolize your drugs. So, so that's just a medication. That's an oral medication. And it is mostly determined by... How fast your liver breaks a medication down so that it is no longer effective. But if you ask me that question, I mean, that's an anecdotal question. I, I'm going to answer it based on my awareness mm-hmm. of myself. Mm-hmm. But surely there are more scientific ways to measure what's going through my body, what's happening in my liver uh, to, to determine an appropriate dosage. Well, if your you- liver is ill, I can tell you that you're going to not metabolize as quickly any kind of drug because it's busy being sick and trying to repair itself. If you're an alcoholic, I was just going to say that I can tell you that your body takes all or your liver takes all of its energy and puts the alcohol first to try to get rid of it. <laughs> the poison and the poison. alcohol go to the head of the line. It always the goes liver. to the head of the line. Yeah. So everything else that you have to get through the liver through that same enzyme system is put to the back of the line and it stays circulating in your body. So alcohol and your intake of alcohol matters. Other medications, like if you have, 
we call this the P450 system. Okay. P450 is a an enzyme system in your liver, and therefore, it, it is usually what most drugs go through to get out of your body or actually get activated. Oftentimes, they have to be activated by the system for you to feel them. So just consider it a traffic jam. If you have one drug going through that system, that's fine. If you have two drugs, probably three, and, and hormones go through that same process. But I see people with seven or eight drugs. And so all those drugs are knocking at the door saying, is it my turn? Is it my turn? They're lining up in the traffic jam and, and they are being put to the back of the line by the drugs that are the, I call them the nastiest or the most um, poisonous. Sometimes we take things that are po- somewhat well, certainly poisonous. Certainly chemo we do. So that, that gets out of our body first because our body put, yeah, yeah prioritizes it. Right. So that's one of the things, but we don't have a good measure. I can tell you that. We can estimate that if you have more than three of those P450 drugs, you're going to slow down the process in all the other. So if I come in and tell you, you know, I have a health history of these different events and I'm on medications for them and I have this medicine, this medicine, Mm -hmm. this medicine. And then you look at me and you say, okay, you're 71, you weigh 200 pounds. I would normally give you a dose of testosterone pellets of X. Mm-hmm. And you factor this other information in. I factor a lot of other things in. What else? But that's that's one of them. So, so I start with an average male, 170 pounds, which is what they still say an average male is, which I doubt in America. But I'm above average. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> uh, so you can be a lot more av- above average if you gain back that 35 pounds you lost. Yeah, well. So, <laughs> so. Um, so we're basing the, you know, you really throw me off. I'm sorry. You know that. So, so we have to, we look at a, an average male makes eight to 10 milligrams of testosterone a day. And so we are going, we'll say 10 and we go up from there. So if, if we start a dose of 1800 milligrams for six months, okay. so if you think about it, 180 days, 10, 1800 milligrams. So that's the average male, the average age, which is not 70, it would be up to 65. So if you're above 65, it would, we drop the dose a little bit. Okay. Then if you exercise more than three times a week for an hour, I'm going to increase your dose because exercise basically makes for us, it's not oral pills, it's pellets that are put in, in the fat. It increases blood flow. Anything that increases blood flow is going to absorb the pellet faster. So exercise, in effect, speeds up your metabolism. Right. It it speeds up your metabolism and it speeds up your blood flow. So the faster your metabolism, the faster your consumption of the testosterone pellet. Right. And, And consumption meaning... You have to get it out of the pellet, so it has to dissolve in fat. Some people have really active fat. Some people have really inactive fat. So mm-hmm. that is unmeasurable. That's the art of it. You have to kind of figure out. Well, but the difference with pellets as opposed to an oral medicine. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you take an oral medicine, they literally measure its half-life or if it's, its efficacy in terms of how often you urinate because it processes through your kidneys. How, and- half-life means how long it takes to get half of that drug out of your body. Exactly. And that's usually you dose it. You dose a drug that you're supposed to be on all the time at the half-life time. If something's 12 hours, you dose it every 12 hours. If it's six, the half-life six, you, you dose it every six hours. That's oral medication. And once again, it's for the 170 pound male. And it's for processing through your body and, and getting rid of it. Right. The distinction that you make about pellets is when they put pellets in your body, they create an on-demand reservoir of that a hormone in your body so that it replicates the system, the way that it worked when you were younger, when your body was producing. Not in the same way, but it still does the absorption absorb is- it. You still absorb it and you can increase your level of testosterone by exercising more. Anything that increases yeah. your um, output, your heart out, uh, blood output and makes speeds up your metabolism. You, so you can get a higher dose when you need it. And when you're sleeping and you're not moving around, you get a lower dose. So the more sedentary I am, and when you interview me and you talk mm-hmm. to me and, and mm-hmm. you say, well, do you, do you work out? Do you 
do this or that or the other. And I said, no, really, I sit in the corner and read a book, you know. So you. So you're not going to need as much. Yes. Because you're not. So I'm not going to use it up. You're not going to use it up as fast. Right. If you say that um, you take when you take medicines, you only need half as much. That tells me that you that I don't need to give you as much testosterone mm-hmm. because you probably process it slowly. Right. Probably get rid of it slowly. So in a first visit, we go through this process. I've I've sent in blood tests that you've requested. I come in with my medical history. We have an interview, and you ask me all these questions. Mm-hmm. You make a decision. It's a crapshoot. I mean, it's the best professional decision that you can make at the time, but then you have to follow up to see how's that working. Right. Because everything, most things in medicine, people think have been, ha, have a way to measure that process. Right. And in, in research facilities, we can measure certain enzyme systems. But when it comes to measuring your enzyme system, which does change every day, you know, it, there is a, a diurnal or a day um, variance, but not enough to affect how you feel usually. Right. So we're giving you an average, but we still can't measure that liver, the the liver enzyme, uh, how fast it is. We have to look at you and all the other things that you do in your life to figure out how fast you're going to use up testosterone. So how long do you give me then before you check back and say, well, let's see how this is working. If I, if I have a really good idea, if you're, I'll say, Simple, but I don't mean simple. I mean, if you're easy to, you don't have a lot of medications, you take I noticed your boy is saying normal, too. Yes, I did. (laughs) So when, when, if you have the, um, when, when you take antibiotics, you only need one, one, whatever, five or seven day course. You don't have to take second courses. You don't have trouble, um, getting your blood pressure down with blood pressure medicine. You don't have to go up to a high level. All of those things tell me something about how you process right. medication, but I have no way of, of truly measuring your ability. There are genetic tests. Let's back up for a second. Okay. There are genetic tests that tell me whether somebody use, has a very fast P450 system or a slow one. There are genetic tests that can tell you mean me like the 23andMe thing or the uh, there, there, Ancestor.com? 20, or? 23andMe has some of that, but there are other specific tests that you can do genetically that, oh, okay. that tells, like that most of the psychiatrists now have a test that will tell which uh, antidepressant is best for you by how you metabolize it. Okay. Does it build up and be, is it stored in your body? Is it is it processed so fast that you don't get the effect? Right. So they have those tests and they use them. But most of us, it's expensive. Most of us don't have the ability to test exactly what we're doing, like hormones. Mm-hmm. So, uh, But there are genetic tests, and I assume that they're going to get better and better, and we're going to be able to find out how fast we uh, use up a drug. But... How, how are we going to use that information? And that's the, nec- that's the next thing. So, so genetics can tell us that habits change our metabolism, size, activity. And I ask all of those things. Right. So, but I look at it like this. I, I look at the chart way ahead of when you show up. Yeah. But you, and I but- have an idea of how big you are, how much you weigh from your activity, from your diet, from your profession. Mm-hmm what your your work schedule might be like i i get an idea of that and then i change it when you come in and and you might tell me something else about your history that changes the dose that i think you're going to need but you're right after that then we have to see how it really works in your body right and this this sounds all sounds very arbitrary but in my mind, it's not. And in the mind of my nurse practitioners and my and uh, the other doctor in my practice, it's not. But they do this all the time. They see this multiple times right. a day. Right. That's why they call it medical practice. Yeah. But this And this is something that is not really recognized widely by other physicians as, I mean, they don't dose things differently. I mean, Keflex is 250 milligrams four times a day and... And ampicillin is they just learn the rope. 250 or 500 three yeah. times a day. And it doesn't matter how big you are, how small you are, unless you're in pediatrics, which does make a difference. But once we're adults, everybody's the same size. Yeah. And which 
makes medicine in itself a crapshoot. Yes. Because you, if you're, if you have an unusual liver, or if you have an unusual genetic property, which is sometimes about metabolism. Other times, it's about your sensitivity to the hormones. So okay. we now know that if you have a certain area on your on your chromosome 10, that you may be more sensitive to testosterone or less sensitive. And it has to do with your inheritance. We can now measure that in research, in research facilities, but we don't measure it every day to see if I need to give a higher dose or a lower dose to somebody because of how they'll receive it. Mm -hmm. Then it's not about metabolism. Then it's not about the other things you do. It's about your genetics and and how your cells are gonna grab the testosterone, how they're gonna use it. Are they sensitive and they're gonna grab a lot of it? Are they resistant and they're not gonna grab very much and, and I have to use more and more to fill up all of their testosterone uh, so, receptors. So the first time I come in, You've never seen me before. We go through all that process. Mm -hmm. You make a decision and you give me pellets, mm -hmm. 1,800 milligrams. Mm -hmm. Then you have me come back in three, four months out. Usually uh, for men, I have them come four to five months depending four to five. on my uh, insecurity as to whether I think they're going to use them up too fast. Right. If I think they're going to use them up too fast but don't want to overdose them, right. I bring them in in four months. If I think that... They're going to metabolize. They're easy to read. They don't smoke. They don't drink a lot. They don't, you know, they don't, they're not marathoners. They're, you know, they're pretty middle of the road, everything. Right. I, uh, then I can have them come back in five months. Okay. And the goal is to set them on a twice a year schedule for right. getting pellets. Mm -hmm. And for those whose metabolisms make that not possible, mm -hmm. then in that revisit, you make a determination you need to come in every four months, every five months, every six months. Every seven months. I have some men some that, come in that are so much slower. Months. Yes. Right. And they're not necessarily 75 or 80. They, that's just Their metabolism. how they use it. They're yeah. lucky because they don't have to come in as often. Yeah. They don't have to use as much testosterone. Right. But they get the same effect. Yeah. So I, by looking at everything I look at, I have to chalk that up to their genetic sensitivity to testosterone. That they're very sensitive to it. They, they, and they don't use it up. They don't burn through it. So in our discussion today, we've been talking about men. How is the process different for women or is it? Women have a few other factors. The, the good news is women don't need as much testosterone. So when you have a large dose, you've got lots of variable. When, when most women need between 175 and 350 milligrams for four months, Okay. Then that's less variable for me. <laughs> when you have that kind of span, then you're not going to make as big a mistake as if you give somebody 2,500 milligrams. So you don't see a radical shift typically. Right. You, right. You, you can make the determination, well, we can stretch you to five months mm -hmm. or we need to get you in every three months. But I start, so I start both men and women at like men are 1800 and I go up for marathoning and I go down for over 70 and you I have this factor you know, system. So I, yeah, yeah. So I, so that's exactly how I think of it. Yeah. And it's, it's not arbitrary. It is based on how much testosterone is used over a period of time in my experience for those people who do those things. Mm -hmm. So it does take a lot of experience for women. Um, smoking, I have to increase by about 50 milligrams for smoking. Marathoning, another 50 milligrams. People who have polycystic ovaries are used to a higher level of testosterone or androgen, so I have to go up another 50. I mean, so, and I go down for people who are less than 100 pounds and uh, who are sedentary. They don't move around a lot. They don't exercise. They may just watch TV all the time, but they don't also have any bad habits like too much smoking, too much drinking. Right. So they're also not burning through it for that. They're not taking pills that would burn through it like, uh, say, uh, ADD medicine makes you burn through it faster. What about stress levels? So stress is, is something that isn't a met metabolic thing. It's not burning through your estrogen or testosterone. It is 
binding up your testosterone. So I can give you a certain dose. You go through surgery, your cortisol goes like crazy because that's what you you do when you're under that type of stress, physical stress. Cortisol goes up. When cortisol goes up, cortisol binding protein goes up and it binds your testosterone. So it so it inactivates it. Yeah, so that's again part of the issue about the practice of medicine is you have to make some informed decisions about the level of stress in somebody's life. Right, I do, and I ask those questions, yes. but I need to know ahead of time right. for the dose before your surgery, mm -hmm. when you're having surgery, so that I can give you more to get you through the surgery, meaning for that one time, right. so that I can get you through the full four months so you don't come in at three months going, they're gone. Yeah. You know, so... Yeah. Just so that I'm not trying to get you to come in all the time. I'm trying to have a normal four month schedule. So that helps me if I, if you're regularly every four months, that keeps you in a, it keeps you from building up. Yeah. Too much testosterone. So, so, so there's the psychological stress of the anxiety about surgery. Right. But there's the physiological physical stress. stress of your body trying to heal itself. Right. Or if you're and in so an So you accident. can anticipate that. Right. You need more. So a lot of doctors yeah. or surgeons will say, don't take it. But then you're not going to heal well because right. testosterone helps you heal faster. Right. So I used to put pellets in. If I did a hysterectomy, I would do a hysterectomy and put estrogen and, proge and testosterone pellets in right at the surgery. Wow. So that I put it in the incision. So I didn't make another incision in their hip. I put right. it in the incision, uh, their low incision into the fat that I could find. And that carried them for four months. So yeah. they never had menopausal symptoms. They never had that terrible feeling of when your hormones are all gone. Right. So, so, but, but that's to help them through their surgeries. So all in all then that this discussion today is about the complication factors of being able to know how much of a dose to give and how often it's and complicated but after you get used to assessing things it's almost like you do it it's like by, anything else it's a skill set that you acquire right you don't even think about it you just go oh that you're going to need that dose because in your mind you've gone, you need more for this, less for this. And if you change your lifestyle, yeah. I need to know that. Cause I have a lot of people that come in and say, well, I don't ride bikes anymore. I used to ride with a group of people. Right. We'd ride lots of miles. We'd go on trips, but I don't do that now. But if I felt better, if my muscles were stronger, right. I would do it. So then I'm like, you got to tell me when you're going to start doing this because It'll change. The dose I give you today yes. is not going to be the dose that you're going to need when you start doing that. So yeah. there has to be a communication going on between my nurse practitioners and, who are very skilled at this and or the patient and me and the, and the patients and the nurse practitioners because we have to adjust dose for your life. And it's all very individual. That's why it's very hard to teach. And it's important to get the message out to anybody that's thinking about getting testosterone pellets don't go to a mass production facility where one size fits all go to a physician that knows what they're doing and will spend the time with you to learn about your metabolic system your stress levels your general health concerns and dose you properly thank, thank you for you. listening email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com you can find the BioBalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BioBalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BioBalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.